Russia's strategic bomber fleet is taken out with open source gaming software. Germany shows it's serious about breaking away from US software and cloud providers. And quantum internet is real, but you won't be using it for Facebook, at least not for a while. Welcome to Hashtag Trending. I'm your host, Jim Love. Let's get into it. Ukraine just used 20-year-old open source software originally designed for model airplane enthusiasts to destroy a third of Russia's strategic bomber fleet. Operation Spiderweb, as Ukraine called it, was one of the most audacious military strikes in recent history. On Sunday, 117 drones simultaneously attacked five Russian airbases scattered across thousands of kilometers, some as far as Siberia, 4,300 kilometers from Ukraine. The secret weapon? Arju Pilot, a software that began in 2007 when tech journalist Chris Anderson built a drone autopilot system out of Lego Mindstorms in his basement. It was designed for hobbyists who wanted their model planes to fly themselves. And it got its name from the Arduino processor. Today we'd regard it largely as a toy, but that was where it started. Anderson watched footage of the attack in disbelief. That's Ardu Pilot, launched from my basement 18 years ago. Crazy, is what he wrote on LinkedIn. His co-creator, Jason Short, was equally stunned. Not in a million years would I have predicted this outcome. I just wanted to make flying robots. As simple as the technology was behind it, the operation was complex. It took 18 months to plan. Ukrainian agents smuggled drones into Russia, hidden inside trucks with false roofs that looked like ordinary cargo containers. And when the attack began, the roofs opened remotely and drones launched simultaneously across multiple time zones. The beauty of using something simple like ArduPilot was its reliability under poor conditions. While Ukrainian operators controlled the drones via Russian mobile networks from hundreds of kilometers away, the software handled stabilization and basic navigation even when communication lagged. The attack represents something absolutely astonishing. $2,000 drones running free software destroyed $7 billion worth of strategic bombers. It's asymmetric warfare taken to its absolute extreme. Hobbyist technology defeating some of the world's most sophisticated military equipment. As one drone expert put it, modern warfare now belongs to those who can innovate while keeping costs down. When open source software developed for weekend hobbyists can take out a nation's strategic air force, we're clearly in a new era. And the creators of ArduPilot never intended their weekend project to reshape geopolitics. But sometimes, that's just how history gets made. And speaking of another historic moment, here's something that sounds like it's out of science fiction, but it's actually happening right now. Researchers have successfully sent quantum messages across more than 250 kilometers using ordinary fiber optic cables. The quantum internet is no longer just a concept or a dream. The recent breakthrough happened in Germany, connecting Frankfurt and Kassel with a relay station in between. Now, what makes this special isn't just the distance. It's that they did it using almost normal infrastructure. We're talking about standard commercial fiber optic cables at room temperature, proving this technology can work outside the laboratory. And the magic here is quantum key distribution. It's an ultra-secure way of sharing encryption keys. If someone tries to intercept a quantum message, they destroy it in the process. It's sort of like Schrodinger's message. Even if they're fine with destroying it, they won't get much useful information out of it. And the point is, this is no longer just academic research. The Japanese company Toshiba recently announced they've successfully combined quantum key distribution with regular internet traffic in a single fiber cable, meaning quantum security could potentially run alongside your normal internet connection. But before you get too excited about quantum encrypted cat videos, there's a sobering reality. 
The quantum bit rate in that German demonstration was about 100 bits per second. Now, to put that in perspective, if I've got this right, it was a long time ago. For those of you who remember your first 300 baud dial-up modem, those modems were about three times faster at about 300 bits per second. Now, fortunately for most of us, quantum security is massive overkill. You don't need a quantum computer and its encryption to shop on Amazon or even to do your own online banking. In fact, the U.S. National Security Agency has explicitly advised its government against using quantum key distribution. Their reasoning? They say it's expensive, unnecessary, and very susceptible to noise, which makes denial of service attacks much easier. And we already have what is called post-quantum cryptography, security protocols that can't be cracked by quantum computers and don't require quantum infrastructure to create or send. Matter of fact, some of the VPN providers already have this. So why pursue the quantum internet? Right now, the most likely usages might be to communicate between quantum computers themselves. There are a few other practical uses yet. But as we move towards quantum computing, this is just another step in establishing that it is, is a reality, although one, at least for now, that we're struggling to imagine how we can really put to good use. But these barriers are being broken down, and Canadians are doing a lot of that work as well. We've seen the ability to generate true random numbers, something classical computers cannot do. Another Canadian firm, NordQuantique, claims to have made advances that will vastly shrink the size of future quantum computers. And if you remember, what we now call the Internet was just an experiment, preposterously slow, driven by those 300 baud modems, and to which many said, what's the big deal? And recently, there was another crazy experiment. Somebody looked at this thing called ChatGPT 1.0 and said, this is all you got? Quantum internet is possible. So these developments, although they don't have an immediate use, will undoubtedly be part of the future. If you're interested in this topic, there's a great video from Sabine Hossenfelder. I mentioned the physicist turned YouTube host that covers it really well. She covers the science of it accurately and you don't need a degree in physics. I'll post a link in the show notes. So quantum internet is possible. Don't cancel your regular service anytime soon. Two announcements this week perfectly capture Europe's complex relationship with digital sovereignty and a new determination to break free from American tech dominance. Germany's new digital minister, Karsten Wildberger, made his intentions crystal clear at the Republika conference. He wants open standards and open source to become the guiding principle for German technology policy. His goal? Reducing dependence on U.S. tech giants and building what he calls a Germany stack, a unified IT infrastructure based on European values. The urgency to become more independent of traditional software providers, cloud service providers, and big tech companies from the U.S. is greater than ever, Wildeberger declared. The statistics he cited are sobering. Over 75% of European cloud data sits in the hands of U.S. hyperscalers like AWS, Google, and Microsoft. There's a lot at stake here. The cloud is an enormous amount of revenue. And again, with these large enterprises accounting for about two-thirds of the market. The loss of that revenue would be a big problem for these U.S. companies. So as much as there's tension with Europe about regulation, Cloud and software providers want to be seen as meeting this new demand for digital sovereignty. AWS has already gone part of the way. They've enabled clients to hold their own encryption keys so that the data can only be decrypted by the client and AWS can't be forced to turn over data, even if instructed by their own government. But whether this next point, promising a European sovereign cloud will be enough is a matter for some debate. Definitely, it will be something that Europeans and maybe even Canadians might embrace until there's an actual sovereign alternative. Because, at least in the current climate, there is a new push from Germany and others to achieve 
digital sovereignty, which goes beyond data sovereignty. Wildeberger talks about creating alternatives to digital payments and social media and building trustworthy infrastructure with European values. The minister acknowledged this will not happen overnight, noting that it's about raising awareness for change. And as Europe grapples with its digital future, these parallel announcements show just how complex the path is from data sovereignty to digital sovereignty. Given the recent tensions between Canada and the U.S., it might be interesting to hear what Canada's plans might be. And that's our show. And for those of you who've been asking about show notes and links and even great ways to share these podcasts with your friends, we have been busy revamping our website and we have a great place to see the latest episodes and to play past episodes and to get show notes on the site. You can check it out at technewsday.com or .ca. Take your pick. Love to hear from you. Love to hear what you thought about the show. Love to hear what you think about the site. Drop us a note at editorial at technewsday.ca or catch me on LinkedIn. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just drop a comment under the video. I'm your host, Jim Love. Have a thrilling Thursday.